Kia ora and good evening, everyone. My name is Hamish Rogers. I am a sport development consultant with Sport New Zealand. And for those of not had the pleasure of meeting, I am the editor in chief uh, that sits behind, normally in the back room uh, of the Balance Better website. I'm really excited about tonight's webinar, uh, talking about the principles of training design. I'll, I'll throw it over to the experts in a second. Um, but basically, what I'll do, I'll just kind of welcome us in. So we'll be hosted tonight by my good friend Dave Wright, and he'll be joined by his good friend Dan Cook. Dave is the co-founder of the Player Development Project. The Player Development Project, for those who are unaware, uh, they really like the engine behind the Balance the Speed of website. But in tonight, instead of having them in the background, we'll be leaning on their expertise and bringing them to front of stage. Uh, for those coaches, particularly football coaches, who are serious about taking their craft to the next level, I'd encourage you to check out the Player Development Project's uh, own website at playerdevelopmentproject.com and check out their offerings to support you with your own coaching. Uh, we will just settle into our own um, kaupapa tonight with the Sport New Zealand Karakia. Alright Dave, I've done enough talking and jibber jabbering. I'm going to hand it over to you and disappear now and you can really get us into the fun stuff. Awesome. Thanks so much, Hamish. It's um, awesome to be here and great to see so many people pouring into the room. Um, thank you so much for sharing where you're coaching and where you're based. It's great to see people from around the world as well, which is awesome. Um, first and foremost, before I get to Dan Cook, my good friend and colleague from Player Development Project, um, a little bit of housekeeping. So many of you are already utilizing that chat box. This is a great place to connect with others, share your thoughts on anything you're hearing, and of course, ask questions. So as we go, do ask us some questions. Um, if you want to challenge anything, we always welcome a good, honest discussion. Um, we'll do our best to get to you. There is a fair bit of content to get through um, this evening, so we will try and move at a bit of a steady pace. Um, if you do need any technical support at any point, if your Wi-Fi fails or the webinar software lets you down for any reason, uh, Hamish is in the background. You can message him around uh, technical support, and you can log back in using the same link that you got in your email. Uh, one thing to flag here is there's a couple more webinars coming up in March. We've got some great guests and some great topics on March 15th and March 29th, and you will see more through the Balances Better newsletter on that. So with all that said, Dan, welcome. Awesome to have you here, mate. How are you? I'm great. Thanks, Dave. Looking forward to learning and being here with everybody again. Great stuff, mate. And uh, look, we've got to sort of get through this and just learn a bit about each other. Now, we know each other pretty well, but just very quickly, can you tell <laughs> us a little bit about your work and your experience? Yeah, so I was born and raised in the southwest of England, and I spent the past 14 years kind of in parallel of the academic world um, and the coaching world, mostly in football. It's taken me from the UK into the States for a few years and then into New Zealand where I ended up doing my PhD in, in movement skill learning, particularly delving into some of the topics that we'll discuss tonight. And how about yourself? Can you introduce yourself a little bit for us as well? Yes, yeah, so as Hamish said, I'm co-founder of Player Development Project. We're an online learning platform uh, which creates content uh, around coach education, particularly focused on football, but across a range of disciplines. In my own coaching, I've uh, been lucky enough to coach in New Zealand, Australia and England. Um, at all levels and spent five years in the UK at both Brentford and Fulham, uh, working in the academy programs there where I did my UEFA A licence. Uh, since returning down under, I've coached at Melbourne Victory and in New Zealand, I've been involved with the New Zealand Football Under-17 RTC program and currently doing a bit of work at Birkenhead United in a part-time capacity as head of coaching. So i um, hoping that we can share some of our experience tonight and um, connect with the audience as best we can. So as I said, great to see so many messages uh, coming into the chat box. Do ask us questions on the run. We will do our best to get to them. Now, before we kick into the presentation, there's a few things to discuss, A, around what we'll cover, and B, just around the um, presentation itself. So we're going to try and focus on designing sessions that facilitate joy, that enhance learning, and increase decision-making for youth players. We're going to talk about some key ideas that involves a concept called the practice spectrum, we're going to discuss some scenarios and how you could possibly apply some of those ideas to your environment. 
and we'll link some practical examples, um, which will have a little bit of a football flavor given that is our context, um, but we'll also try and talk about and reference other sports as well through those examples. The main thing from my perspective to get across is, uh, I guess, that coaching is not black or white. There's a lot of ambiguity in terms of uh, coaching itself. So we'll present some information tonight, um, but it's certainly not a case of this is um, the, the way. We're just going to talk about some ideas which might enhance your environment. As I said, Dan and I's football background will, in, will ensure that we do reference that because that's our lens. But we want to make sure that you try and connect some of these ideas to different invasion games or different sports. Thirdly, we do have a diverse audience. We don't know all of you uh, that well, so it's great to hear where you're coaching and a bit more about you. We've tried to pitch the presentation at a level which will challenge your thinking. For some, it might be a really big step. For others, it might be smaller. And of course, others, it might be the level they work at. Due to time constraints, we'll try and move through the presentation at a steady pace and tackle those questions when we can. Uh, and we do recommend you might want to make some notes as you go. So Dan, I think I've covered all bases there, mate. Are you confident I haven't missed anything? Yeah, you've covered covered a lot of bases. I would say the the key thing for us with what we're looking at the slide here is we're all interested in transfer. So when we talk about joy and learning and increasing decision making, is it transfers into long term development in in the weekend's performance, but for the years to come as well. So we'll 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 crack into that with our principles that we discussed tonight. Absolutely. So let's start off with this idea of the three R's. I know in my own coaching um, education, particularly this was an idea that I was presented in the UK while I was doing some qualifications over there. First time I'd seen this idea um, was through various experts. But for me, the three R's are a really good start point. And I think the image on the right um, is an important one for people to consider as they um, work their way through the content that we'll present and start to try and translate that back to their own environment. So Dan, from your perspective, what value do the three R's present? So really important for us um, in terms of the enhanced learning piece. So if we think about repetition, it's really important to, in, to address here is when we ask how often does the player get to repeat the action or interaction in your session, is we're looking at their, their opportunity to repeat solving the problem. So, so often we talk about um, repeating the technical execution of an ideal model that's prescribed by us as a coach or as a teacher, hey, this is exactly how we want you to pass the ball, exactly how we want you to catch or, or dribble with the ball. Whereas when we talk about repetition, we're actually talking about repetition um, of solving the problem. And so that's where the idea of repetition without repetition comes in that we'll discuss a little bit later. So I think that's a, re a really important piece to address when it comes to repetition on this slide. Mm. How about you? What jumps out to you with realism and relevance? Well, first of all, I think this is, you know, you'll see this further in the presentation, but this question has to underpin what we do. What is our session design? Um, what are the outcomes we're looking to achieve within our session design? So realism for me is fundamental around, um, does it look like the game? This is a big question. Um, if the action or interaction that we're putting on within a session um, is not realistic to what the players are going to experience either in different parts of training or, of course, uh, more importantly, on game day, then there's got to be questions asked. Now, we'll talk about how we can dial up and down um, the practice spectrum in due course and where that kind of fits. Um, for me, the other thing is the image on this slide is really important. Now, I'm not a DJ, Dan. I don't know how many times you've um, stood behind the decks <laughs> and, um, and tried your hand, but the idea of dialing up the treble and bass as an example, um, for me, is a critical one in terms of getting your head around the three R's and when we talk about the practice spectrum shortly, because often there is a trade-off. And when we go up in one area, for example, realism, we might go down in repetition. And as Dan alluded to, that's not um, meaning that repetition without repetition um, won't exist and that we won't repeat certain moments, but it might be dialed down. So that's, that's kind of how I see that realism versus repetition piece. And I think the image is quite powerful. For you, where does relevance come into this and um, in terms of uh, your thinking around designing sessions and why is it important? It's where I begin all session designs with who is in front of me. And that's where relevance really sits at the heart of answering that question. So the position they play, the stage of their development, like we've got on the, the screen there. But it can also be external life factors that we're aware of, what they have going on. Like, is there exams going on at school? Do they have school training this morning and now are they arriving with us in the evening? Mm. Um, so that really comes into relevance in addition to the, the action or the individual areas of the pitch that we have there is it's the, the broader context and it's all about who is in front of me. 
So that's the key piece for, for relevance that, that sits at the heart of session design for me. Yeah, I like it. I like it. So let's move forward and we're going to dive straight into this piece. Now, this is a big piece of the presentation. Uh, this is a piece of work that's been pulled from one of the player development project uh, coaching courses um, and something that we've referenced very regularly. It's important to reference the person that came up with this, Danny Newcomb at Oxford Brooks University in the UK. Danny is a professional hockey coach, um, has worked with Wales uh, and I believe Great Britain at the Olympics. Um, really nice guy. And he came up with this idea of the environment design continuum and some of his work. So I think we've got to talk through this um, at a pace here and, and, and make sure that we really paint some pictures. So drawing your attention to the bottom left of the practice spectrum, you'll see terms like technical emphasis and closed practice on the axes there. And you'll also see the word unopposed drill. Now, drill itself it can be a pretty polarizing word uh, in the world of coaching, given the history of drills and where they come from. And that's saying that's worth considering. But Dan, if we, if we just start at that end of the spectrum, for you, where do the three R's tie into this? And what's the importance of understanding that particular sort of bottom left corner of this image? Mm -hmm. So if I'm looking at the, the bottom left corner of the image and we're thinking back to your DJ analogy, <laughs> is I'm probably seeing high levels of, of repetition here because there is a lower level of opposition. It's normally going to be in a smaller numbers involved in this level of practice. So I'm going to see more of a, a technical emphasis, like it says on, the, says on the screen. So with that comes high repetition. But then if we think about the realism of the, of the other R that we discussed, then that's probably likely a little less here because we don't have the opposition involved. There's not the decision making best uh, based on the relevant information in the, in the environment. So that's where we're going to see that less decisions and less transfer coming from this end. Is Absolutely. there anything else that you would add to that? Oh, I think I think your point around the lack of realism and decision making is critical. And it's not to say that repetition isn't valuable, but we're, what we've got to do is understand where in our context that sits during the week. And I think we'll talk about that around relevant um, contacts, contacts, meaning a training session or a game that we might uh, have players in our care during that week. Also want to flag that the language on here might change across sports. So this is one example. Obviously, there's a lot of similarities between football and hockey, given that they're both um, games that feature 11 players um, on a team at, at, uh, at least senior level. Um, so I think whether these terms apply is, is um, relevant to your sport, but we'll move on through. So as we head away from unopposed and unopposed drills and unopposed practice, we get to this point of variable practice. Dan, what does that term mean for you? And how might that manifest itself in a session? Mm -hmm. So variability for me is that that's where the idea of repetition without repetition comes in, is that yeah. we will see the repetition of the interaction in the environment, but it will change. It will look a little bit different each time. So there might be variability in the behaviors of the individuals that we're watching. So how they're mm -hmm. solving a problem might be different each time, whether that be a 1v1 in basketball, in football, in, in hockey. It can be slightly different. It can also be um, intentionally adapted by us as coaches as well. So I might add in variability by who they're up against. I might add in variability by the equipment that we're using, the number of players that we're using. It can come into how we design our sessions as well as we can instill this variability. So if we move along the spectrum from left to right, you can kind of see how we might um, change, change that by, uh, by using different practices across the spectrum as well. Absolutely. I like to think of interference practices, which we will show some examples of as heading sort of between that unopposed variable practice where there might be a little bit of randomness, but maybe less opposition or um, less consequence in the practice. So as we head towards function or unit, I'm conscious that the word functional practice or function of play is something I first heard about 16 years ago on a coaching course. So this may be old fashioned language to some. Um, but I think what we're trying to describe there is a, is a moment within the game or a scenario that might unfold on the pitch, on the court, whatever your context is, using the relevant people um, that are in that moment and also the geography and the area that that moment might take place. And we'll demonstrate some examples of this shortly. So whether it's a functional practice, unit work, meaning perhaps an attacking group against a defending work, or a phase of play, which might be multiple units working in part of a field or part of a, a court, um, then for me, function or unit practice is very valuable when players have a clear understanding, perhaps, of position or role in a team. Um, and we really want to dive into a little bit more tactical work. Now, you see on the spectrum, 
as you move across, um, we've got tactical emphasis growing versus technical emphasis at that repetition or unopposed end. Dan, for you, when you're planning your sessions, how important are phase of play or functional practices? I think it's uh, hugely important to have in our toolbox. I don't know if I'm going to include in every session that I do. It depends. Like we'll talk a little bit later on as it talks. It uh, depends on the context that I'm coaching within and who I'm, who I'm coaching, where we're at within their development. What do I have available to me? So I think it's really important in terms of having it as a, a potential practice within our sessions. But whether it's the, the be all and end all, I, I don't know. Mm. So we have mm. the, that's why we have the spectrum and that ability to move up and down it to meet the needs of the people that are in front of us. Absolutely. So as we head towards the furthest end of the spectrum now, we've got small-sided games. Now, whether that's 3v3s through to 11v11, or if you're coaching rugby, it could be 15 on 15, of course, then you'd be thinking that as we get towards small-sided games, large-sided games, or, or the macro game, as it's referred to here, uh, the full complement of players on the pitch, there's going to be a high level of realism there's going to be a high level of relevance, but of course, the repetition is going to drop and be a lot lower in this particular context. Obviously, this would be for more tactical or position-specific outcomes. Small-sided games are obviously something Dan and I know are both fans of in terms of um, decision-making particularly, uh, whether it's the ball being thrown or kicked, the ball is going to roll. And I guess in our own coaching approach, we're both advocates of uh, ball rolling time meaning that if you've got a session of 60 minutes and you want to achieve 75% uh, ball rolling time, the ball's going to roll for 45. And small-sided games are really advantageous when working with youth players, particularly um, in terms of ensuring that happens. And I haven't met too many players, Dan, in my time that aren't motivated when they see two goals and a game or <laughs> two hoops and a game, whatever the context is, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's what we all that's what we all started playing for in the first place is that joy and the, the feeling of play when we threw the ball down on the playground or started uh, running around with the ball after school. So, yeah, that reminds us of those moments. I think we shouldn't get awesome. too far away from that when we're coaching. Absolutely. So let's push on. So we're, we're really hoping we've painted some pictures here. So we're going to um, just play out some scenarios in this one. And I guess the first scenario, Dan, we'll read it out for those who are tuning in. You're working with a grassroots sports team that trains once or twice a week for between two to three hours total. They do play a game on the weekend during their winter season. The children play various sports through the year. You've got a limited supply of footballs, a handful of goals, or it could be uh, hoops, nets, or otherwise uh, relative to your sport, and they're aged between seven and 12. So Dan... Let's put each other on the spot here and consider how we might utilize the practice spectrum when planning a session for this group. So the first bit that goes to me is, okay, what's the key information that I'm looking for from the scenario? And we can take stock of our own environments. We're just using this scenario as an example, but we might also look for this information in, in our own, uh, in own scenarios that we have in our, our lives as well. So the things that I'm looking for is I've got one or two sessions. Okay, so that's going to influence what I do. I've got three hours max. So, okay, that's going to influence what I do. Um, we have a game on the weekend. So how can I integrate that into the, the, our training in terms of we're looking for longer term and how that might support learning? And then we have multiple sports throughout the year. So we're probably in a short learning context. If we take a 12-month period, we're probably only playing the sport for a short period of that time. And as is so common within, within our context at grassroots level is we have a limited supply of equipment and we're probably going to lose a little bit more of that as the season goes <laughs> on. And uh, then, we have, then we have seven to 12 year olds that have probably been sat down all day at school and now they're bursting to, to get out and burn some energy. So how can my practice design account for that? So the first piece that jumps out to me is if I've got limited contact time and limited hours is... I don't want to spend too much time veering away from the game because the further I move away from the game is the further I'm, I'm moving away from the joy, from the enhanced learning and from the real information that they're going to need in their, in the training environment to make decisions. So mm -hmm. if we're thinking about the spectrum is I'm in that small sided game for uh, the majority of those two to three hours. So if we're looking for an exact figure on that and we're talking about, our high percentages, if we've got three hours, I'm probably looking for a minimum of two hours of, of game-based activity within that for those reasons of joy and the enhanced learning and the decision-making that can be based on real game information. How about yeah, you? Yeah, 
Yeah, I love it. I mean, look, the big, the big one for me here is this could apply across any number of supports, but the age group is critical. So when I look at seven to 12, I think, well, what's the purpose of sport, right? And if we can engage them, um, a good colleague of mine, Rob Sherman, a friend who's done a bit of work with us at Player Development Project, talked about if coaches can light the fire within young players, then that is success. We want them to come back every season. We want them to stay in the game. Um, so whether that's playing multiple sports or they're passionate about one or two sports, that age of seven to 12 for me is about engagement. We've talked about facilitating joy um, and ensuring that they are really uh, getting to experience the game that they are falling in love with and we don't hinder that. So for me, that's the big one. Um, I think that there is also an opportunity for those who are more engaged and more passionate to encourage them to work away from training down further, uh, sorry, further down the spectrum. So whether that's me and my ball against a wall um, or whether that's me and my friend or sibling passing or throwing a ball in the park, those hours of doing some more um, isolated work perhaps will add value, um, but they're probably less valuable in a group context. So for me, those are, those are probably the couple of big rocks around this scenario. As we're uh, talking through the scenarios, I'd encourage the audience to throw in their suggestions as well mm. and anything that, that they may think or feel into the comments because we want this to be an interactive part of the, of the webinar as well. Absolutely. So let's move on to some practical examples around this scenario. So we talked earlier about variable practices. We talked about small-sided games or large-sided games. So given the age group of 7 to 12-year-old players, they're often, often playing smaller formats of different sports. Some uh, NSOs are particularly good at doing this and others are still modifying games um, for young players. But I think it's important to understand these are some practical examples. So Looking at the one on the left to start things off, Dan, we've got a 1v1 scenario where a player is receiving a ball, trying to face forward and trying to take someone on to score. Uh, the value in this practice for you around tying it back to the three R's, where do you see it? Mm -hmm. So I see that, and I would encourage if you're not a football coach specifically that, to see how this relates to basketball, to see how this can relate to similar scenarios mm -hmm. in hockey um, because you, you can see that this idea of moving the ball in a, in a forward direction but into, a, into an opposed situation is, is common across sports. So thinking about the, the three R's is the first piece is, is there a level of realism? Yeah, I, I agree there is. We've just taken a small game that sits within the larger game. So if we imagine mm. the final adult version of football is the 11 v 11, well, here we've actually just taken a a situation that's a 1v1 or a 2v1 that sits within within the 11v11. So there is there is a level of um, realism that's connected back to the the 11v11 game. We have repetition because there's so few players involved. We have multiple stations set up and we have few players um, to, to the number of balls that are out is we're going to see a lot of numbers of repetition. And importantly, as we spoke about, earlier is you can see that there is variation within that repetition as well so we might get that that variation within repetition by changing who the defender is by changing the starting position um, of the of the ball or of the um, attacking player as you can see in the three different examples there as well so that's how i see repetition mm. within it and then relevance for this age group is we have lots of time to play because we're not in an 11 v 11 we're not stood waiting for the ball to come across to me for, for 10 minutes is no, I'm going to see that it's relevant for the age group because there is uh, lots of lots of time and lots of direct interaction with the ball. That's where the three R's go for me. What, what would you add to that? Yeah, mate, I think you've really got it covered. For me, there's, there's consequence, so I can lose the ball. So in this scenario, if the defender mm -hmm. wins the ball, they might drive out over the line. Um, you could obviously modify this by having a goal for the defender to score in. Um, or a target. So then we could go into those 1v1 sort of scenarios where there is some transition and, and turnover. Um, so for me, everything exists here. And as you said, this is a micro moment, um, could easily be a, a position versus a position. So in football, it could be a center back versus a striker, um, for example, and they're getting high reps and opportunities to do different things. If we move to the middle, I think this one really translates across sports. So as we were preparing this, I was thinking about rugby. So Maybe if you're working with slightly older players in the scenario we mapped out, this could be position specific. It could be a halfback, a first five, a second five working on some kind of combination. Um, it could apply to touch rugby. It could definitely apply uh, to netball if there were hoops at the end and you're looking at smaller units or smaller numbers in a micro uh, example of the game. 
Um, for me, obviously, there is uh, this ticks a lot of boxes as outlined on the uh, on the diagram, but hmm. the repetition is going to be slightly lower. And I think as we move through the numbers from 3v3, 4v4 and beyond that, the reps will probably re uh, reduce further. So there's certainly going to be some repetition, but it's not going to be a lot of identical moments, let's say. Um, but this is fully opposed. Decision making is there. There's an incentive with either an in goal, an end zone in this particular diagram. You could easily have goals or, or hoops at each end. Um, and it's very much going to be engaging for the players because they're going to get a lot of contact time on the ball again. Um, when we think again in a football context about what some national bodies have done, particularly in Europe with the likes of Germany and Belgium, pretty good case studies of modified games at young ages uh, where there's a lot of 1v1 through to sort of 2v2, 3v3 and 4v4 football in this 7 to 12 age group. Um, so they get a lot more contacts on the ball and that's motivating for young players. Dave, if we go to the three R's here, so realism, repetition and relevance. Repetition has a, has a minus or what's a, a level score here compared to repetition with a tick in the first practice. Mm. is if I'm comparing those two and I'm just looking at it, I might think, well, the 1v1 or 2v1 has all the ticks. Why wouldn't I stick with that? Mm. So what would be some of the reasons that I might move into this 3v3, like what, in particularly in relation to the realism, repetition and relevance that we've spoken about? Yeah, so I think you know the constraints or the, the rules that go on that first practice on the left could be that once the player receives the ball in red, they have to go 1v1. They can't give the ball back. So that could be one rule. You could obviously modify that to say, yes, they're now allowed to pass it back and it becomes 2v1. In the next scenario, for me, so that for me is me on my own dealing with a defender and having to um, uh, deal with that scenario solo. In this, we're then progressing the practice to say, okay, now it's about me and the relationship with my teammates. So in team sports, they're obviously team sports for a reason. Um, for me, I'm a big believer in individual development in a team context. And this is now where we start to link some of those content, um, some of those ideas, sorry, uh, between myself on my own as a player and now me with my friends as a player and how do I link some of those decisions that I might have made in the 1v1 practice and apply those in the 3v3. So that for me would be how it transfers. Is that a, is that a fair answer? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It, it feels like listening to you that the level of realism is scaling up a little bit compared yeah. to the 1v1 or 2v1 because there's more options available to me, which is Absolutely. Uh, relatable to the size of the games that we'll end up playing as well. Yeah. Well, look, we'll keep pushing on. Obviously, we've got the larger sided game there. We won't go into too much detail around that. It's fairly obvious where it sits in terms of the graphic. And, and we've just shown some examples that apply to that scenario. So let's work quickly through another one. You're working with grassroots sports teams that train three times a week now, approximately three to five hours, and they do have a game on the weekend. We're now talking about youth players in that 12 to 15 age group. Some of the children are starting to get serious about their chosen sport. Many play school and club sport. And players are starting to establish areas of the game that they enjoy playing in. So this could be positions or roles within a team. You have a club facility with plenty of equipment. So now you might be working in a slightly more well-resourced environment, Dan. What do you do? Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to draw everybody's attention to the key differences here. So we have a few more hours in the week. Last time we had two to three. This time we got three to five. The players are slightly older. So we've gone into that um, early secondary school age group of 12 to 15. And now we have um, the idea that they're not playing multiple sports as much as they were when they were younger. Now they're starting to move into a chosen sport. And they have particular areas of the game that they're starting to see themselves in as well. So it's not multiple positions, not playing all the positions of the pitch. They have an area of the pitch, at least, that they're enjoying to play in. And alongside that, we're having... Um, access to more resources too so that could be the, the amount of equipment it could be the amount of coaches it could be how long we have that uh, particularly training facility available to us as well so i just wanted mm -hmm. to draw the the listeners attention to the key details that we that, uh, that are slightly different to scenario one and i'm definitely yep. going to pass this one back to you because you <laughs> uh, made me go first scenario one <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah look i think i think again you, you you've shined a light on some of those ideas so let's move to the practical ones and then i'm going to take a little pause um there's a couple of questions that we might try and get to as well that have popped up in the q a so again we've we've got our 1v1 example for me this is re realistic and relevant all the way through you know i've done that 1v1 practice with senior players with very young players those moments exist whatever form of the game you play but if we've now got that increased level of contact time perhaps we've got players who are 
uh, let's say, uh, becoming more competent or clear in their positions, um, then this is where that functional practice or that middle part of the practice spectrum that we alluded to comes in. So you can see in the middle diagram, we've actually just um, marked off an area of the pitch. So a real world problem for a lot of coaches is they might plan for 16 kids and only 11 turn up and how we, how we adapt our session could be as simple as just working in an area as opposed to the full pitch. That's one way to utilize a uh, functional practice. So in this middle example, you can see that we have a target player in green. So there is some uh, consequence. If the red players win the ball, they can play into that target player or into the goals. And again, you could change scoring mechanisms there. Um, we're going to have uh, less repetition because, again, it's a game-based um, position-specific moment of the game. So there's going to be turnovers. There's going to be attack, defense, and transition, those moments of the game. Um, and there's obviously direction in the form of one team attacking the bigger goal. And most importantly, with the position-specific focus, they're working in realistic areas. So my right winger in blue is up against the left fullback in red, and they're going to have opportunities to repeat that moment that you see on the left practice actually in a bigger event. Um, so for me, this is where perhaps, I guess, in a football context, particularly tactical work starts to become a little bit more in focus at this age group. And again, that might be relevant to the purpose of those children playing the sport. You know, if it's just social community sport, it may just be we go with games all the time to keep that engagement and keep them coming back. But if we're working a little bit harder on game understanding and tactics, then functions or phases may have some uh, part to play. Dan, any thoughts to add around these? Yeah, just as we're trying to dig into some practical takeaways for the coaches that are listening here, is I'm wondering if you can give us two to three details from that function practice that give it a tick in the realism box for you. Yeah, so for me, the first thing is, is the positional nature of it. So you can see in this session, we didn't have enough players to have our right fullback in red. So we've cut the pitch off on an angle there to say, well, we're just going to work with players that will be in those zones. Now, that's not to say that um, those players aren't important, but obviously if the ball can't shift there, then the right back is unlikely to be playing in that area. So the line is not, um, I guess, set and certainly not to scale on the image, but you get the idea um, that we've now got two center defenders against a striker. We've got a winger versus a fullback on the left. We've got two central midfielders against two central midfielders. But of course, both teams have that neutral outlet player. So in terms of realism, the geography and the positions mm -hmm. and, and I guess the um, opposition they're up against are the things that make this realistic. Yeah, I love that. So the position of the players on the pitch, the position of of where the exercise is on the geography of the pitch, like you said, and the idea that we have a, a direction to it as well. Mm, nice. Absolutely. I'd like to go to a question from Alicia Thompson, who's chimed in saying, when thinking about younger players, would success be a major factor as well to build confidence and joy? Is this more important than any of the factors you've identified? So I don't want to put words in Alicia's mouth around success, but I'm thinking this may be alluding towards results and obviously um, potentially getting success in the session. So there's kind of, that's how I'm interpreting it, at least. Alicia, feel free to chime in with any more information that can help Dan and I. Dan, what's your first take on that question, um, whichever interpretation you choose to go with? <laughs> yeah, so my, my mind goes uh, straight to appropriate challenge. Yeah. So when I think about appropriate challenges, if it's too easy for me, so if my skill set is higher than the challenge that's being set for me and it's too easy, I'm likely to feel bored. Mm. If the challenge is too high compared to where my skill set is at, I'm likely to feel anxious, you know, quite stressed about not being able to find that level of success that I think uh, the question's alluding to. But then there's that sweet spot in the middle um, of appropriate challenge where I'm just on the edge of learning. So maybe if I have have five goes I'm successful three or four times but there's one that that got me you know or one or two that got me so that idea of appropriate challenge finding the uh, the edge of learning is what comes out to me because I completely agree with Alicia that an idea of a feeling of success is is really really important but if all I feel in success in training whether I'm extremely young or whether I'm a, an elite performer um, trying to push the boundary all I feel is success then I'm likely to to have some level of boredom and, and feel um, not, not engaged with the practice, and that's going to impact learning in the long run. So my, my mind went to the idea of appropriate challenge. And if you want a nicer way to think about that is Goldilocks. 
So is the porridge too hot? Is the porridge too cold? Or is the porridge just right? Is a, is a nice way to, to think about that as well. Absolutely. How about your thoughts? Yeah, look, I, I think you're spot on. I think, and this will tie into our next scenario, which I'll slide over to. Before we get to that, I think to build on your question, uh, I've worked in environments where you do have players for four or five uh, contacts a week between training and games. And that's where you do have the luxury of uh, moving around the spectrum a little bit more and um, if, if, it, if it's an opportunity for, for example, uh, attacking players to, to get a feeling of hitting the back of the net through high repetition and less opposition, um, and you've got the time and space within the environment to do that, for me, that's where you can have that feeling of success. And then you can scaffold or ramp up the challenge um, to say, hey, we're now going to put some opposition in or we're now going to put you into that small sided game. Maybe the area is really tight to make it difficult. Maybe the area could be bigger to make it a little bit easier. Um, so there's lots of ways we can manipulate the practice through space and through that level of challenge, um, which will get them success beyond just results on the weekend, obviously. So Dan, scenario three, um, before we kick on to a couple of other ideas that we'll present to the audience, you're now working in an environment where players are taking their sport seriously. They're possibly competing for selection in regional or national squads. They have a depth of training experience. The children are now aged 13 to 17. Many of these players are showing potential and operating in programs they've been selected to participate in. They train and play over eight hours a week in various environments. So we've touched on that school versus club reality, which is certainly one in New Zealand that I know across sport is a challenge for coaches and players. How do you utilize the spectrum to tackle this one? <laughs> so the... Um boundaries of what, how we have access to them. So in terms of eight hours a week, multiple contacts, and they're really drilled into uh, being focused on, on the sport that we're working with them in, mean that I now have um, the opportunity to work right across the spectrum. You know, mm -hmm. I, have, I have more of an opportunity and good reason to use everything from the left-hand side of the spectrum to the right-hand side of the spectrum to meet the needs of the, the people in front of me. And mm -hmm. to give them the best opportunity of, of, again, enjoying, increasing their learning, which in this instance, they're looking for a performance outcome, learning. They want to, it to carry them further in their sport. Um, and then also alongside that is how I can make sure within those practices is we're containing the key information that will help them with their enhanced decision making. Again, a key attribute that us all as coaches want to help our players with in the competitive arena. So mm. I would use the complete spectrum to, to support the players in those three areas and to meet the needs of them in front of me. Yeah, and I think what you're saying links to these images. So I think if we, we look at the left here, we've got an unopposed drill. Now, this might be a pattern of play. Um, I'm not a huge fan of these in the form of prescribing where players should pass to, for example. I don't mind the use of patterns um, if it's, uh, again, contextual and if the players have some freedom to choose or perhaps they've got some options at least that are presented by the coach. Now, where this kind of practice and unopposed practice might be useful, um, obviously in sports like basketball, which is quite coach-led at times, there might be set plays that players are running through. But similarly, I sort of think to managing training load. We know the challenges for young people out there around playing school and club sport means that there are enormous demands uh, physically and mentally on them week to week, sometimes too much if we're really honest. Um, and this might be where we utilize that. If we know we're in an environment, we've got three or four contacts per week with our, our team, um, we might say, hey, we're going to dial it down. It's match day plus one or the day after a match. Um, and we now need to make sure that these players aren't overcooked. So we're managing physical demands, and we're removing opposition, um, we're reducing the physical load, and we could even reduce the distance around these kind of patterns. This is just one example of an unopposed practice. There's obviously dozens we could have chosen to demonstrate here. Um, but Dan, for you, for you where, where does this sit? Obviously, we've talked about the amount of contact time, but is this something you would utilize if you had that luxury of contact time and, and I guess more advanced players? Yeah, so an unopposed practice for me, like a limitation that we need to address is the idea that the key information isn't there for decision making to happen anymore or the enhanced learning to occur that will transfer to the game. So when I'm talking about the key information here is the opponent. You know, mm. when we're talking about competing um, in a match is what we're doing to, to effectively solve the problems and, and win. Is, mm. is based on what the problems the opponent is presenting to us. So we need to address that's why the, the realism is quite low here. Where I would use this 
is often in a warm up, you know, so we think about physical preparation in a warm up. And also part of that should be uh, technical preparation as well. So in here, in addition to um, the movements of, of my body without the ball, as I can start to say, OK, here I'm receiving, I can start to strike the ball and I'm preparing my body for the session to come in that way. So mm. that would that would be an area where I would, I would see this used if I was thinking about the scenario presented to us would be a lot of the time in warm ups. Absolutely. And, and if we shuffle across one image, we can see this interference practice. So within this, for me, this is a really nice way to engage players with a warm up or work on technical elements. In this example, it's a passing and receiving component. There is some relevance in that these groups of blue, red or yellow players could be units. They could be players that are wide players playing with central players. They're playing across or vertically up and down the field. But there's some interference here. So again, we've got repetition without repetition. There's no consequence around if I lose the ball, um, I'm going to concede a goal. But we're now dialing up the challenge around I've got to find a clear passing line. I've got to find space. I've got to shift the ball into an area. So again, across invasion games, I think these kind of practices can be valuable. Um, and again, a nice way to, to either warm up or manage workload and physicality through the week. Before we go any further, I do want to tackle a question, Dan, from Angela, which is a really nice one. She said, small-sided games seem easier when there is a relatively balanced level of skill across the team. How do you adjust this when some players are less confident and or skillful? Small games seem to work well for the more skilled, confident players um, who get more time on the ball in these scenarios. So there's a couple of words already in my head, but before I, I sort of um, give my answer, Dan, what are you thinking, mate? Mm -hmm. Same as before. You go first. <laughs> I went first. Well, so I, I feel like I am quizzing you. I want to hear your mind. Yeah, yeah, I want to. I want to hear your thoughts. Well, first, of all, the first thing that came to mind when I read the question was managing difference. I think even in, um, let's say, more advanced groups, if we're working with players who have been selected, there's always going to be a difference between players at whatever point in their player development journey they're on. So I think Angela's question is around managing difference. How do I support those players who are perhaps less technically competent or confident on the pitch versus a player who might have trained for many more years and is just um, slightly ahead of the curve at this point? So there's ways we can do that in the form of um, one, one way I've loved to do it, which also has some great psychological outcomes, is utilizing overloads. Now, this might mean a game of 7v6, for example, where we say, okay, one team's going to have seven players, another's going to have six, and that's okay. We don't always need to seek perfection around numbers and deal with even numbers in terms of teams. Um, so I think that's one thing where we can say, hey, we'll balance up the team with a couple of players who are stronger. We'll give those with less numbers a challenge around resilience and um, dealing with an overload in a game. Um, and then that obviously affords the team with more players a little bit more time on the ball or opportunity. Um, I think as well, there's got to be some conversations had with the player around um, bravery and being confident and what they need from us as a coach in that scenario um, and potentially encouraging them to do a little bit more of that work away from training, which could be more isolated or getting some more um, hours on the ball in their chosen sport. So there's a couple of points from me, Dan. You've had some time to think, mm -hmm. mate. You're on the spot. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I think the problem that Angela raises is something that we would have all faced in our different sporting environments is essentially meeting the, the learning needs of all the, all the children or all the people in front of us. And I think f for me, it's, um, children have such great answers to, to how we can best help them. So I think sometimes co-designing with them and, and flipping mm. the question to them and going, hey, I'm, I'm noticing that this is quite easy for you at the moment. How could we change this to increase the challenge for you? Mm. And I think the idea of sharing that moment with them has so many other benefits, and we're likely to see a complete behavior change to where we, what we may be seeing at that time or, or anything that Angela may be noticing or feeling within our session. Um, but also we're starting to empower the young people to to take ownership of their learning journeys as well. So it's not mm. always dependent upon us designing, upon us changing the challenge for them. It's actually how can they take ownership of of changing the the problem in front of them to, to increase their enjoyment and, and learning as well. So in mm. addition to yours, I would I would be interested to uh, to experiment with posing the question to the people in front of you, Angela, for sure. Absolutely. We can't underestimate what players can come up with at all ages. Mm -hmm. They've got great imagination. So again, mm -hmm. we're just revisiting this image around the practice spectrum so you can see it again from unopposed through to the full version of whatever game you're involved in. 
Um, obviously, there's different trade-offs around technical emphasis versus tactical variability across the spectrum. So we'll push on. We've got a little bit more information to present. So I guess a few slides to um, consider. So we've presented some information around different types of practices. We've discussed in depth the practice spectrum and how we can move up and down that spectrum in our context. But Dan, a few questions here. Where do I start when I go out to plan my next session? These were some good, mm -hmm. some uh, ideas, I guess, that we put together. Um, do you want to run through a couple of these and why they're important when it comes to actually putting pen to paper or using our apps for planning sessions? Yeah. So as, as Dave said, we've got the spectrum and we've got the, the freedom to move amongst it. Um, and the first question I have is, if I'm going to move among, along the spectrum, is why am I doing that? And the first question that comes to my, or the second question that comes after that is, I'm going to choose why based on who the session's for. Mm. So if we think about some of the scenarios, what's the age of them? What's their capabilities? Where are they at on their learning journey in terms of, is, are they just picking up the sport or have they been playing for a, for a few years? Um, so that's gonna, gonna guide every, everything to do with the individual. And that's why these kind of intangible conversations that go on, like we ask people how they are or the children how they are and we touch base with the families and we have these conversations around, around the pitch or around the court or wherever we're at are so important because we get more and more information around learning who they are and, and what's going on with them that we can then start to adapt how we're, how we're supporting them within our session design. So who is the session for is, is always um, the best one for me. And then kind of a follow to question is that is how can I best show up for them? So I think mm -hmm. they're the, the two critical questions that come initially. Then we, we've touched on age of the group. Um, and then, I'll, yeah, I'll pass back to you when we look at some of those later questions in the list. Yeah, look, um, it's a little bit of a tangent. To you? It's a little bit of a tangent, but your point there around what we bring as a coach and the coach as the performer, I think, is critical. Uh, you and I were involved in a conversation recently with a colleague around this and how as coaches, we even if we're having a bad day, sometimes we've still got to get ourselves up and uh, get to training and put on a performance and put our best foot forward for the players, whether that is just bringing some personality, bringing some energy, or putting on really challenging practices for the players. I think that's a key point. So I think it's important that uh, coaches tuning in reflect on some of those um, questions. That could be a useful, um, useful thing to consider as you start to plan your next session. We've also created a bit of a checklist here. So through the slides you've seen previously, you would have seen the images with the different sort of ticks, um, lines or crosses around uh, where the different types of practices fit. This big que question at the start around, does the practice look like, a, look like the game? Obviously, when you strip that down um, to any moment from 1v1 through to the full complement of players in your sport, um, I think that's a really good place to start. But Dan, when we talk about different trade-offs here, we've, we've touched on the three R's. I think this is a really nice slide for those um, tuning in who may want to take this away, grab a screenshot or um, write a few notes mm -hmm. down around it. Because um, for me, this, is, this covers a lot of bases around um, each practice through the spectrum um, and, and how I'm sort of trying to link those in my session plan. Is, is this something that you see value in? And, and if so, why? Huge value. I think it comes back to what you said at the beginning is we're not here as experts to dictate and give all the answers. Mm. We're, we're here to, to provoke thought and guide thought. And I think these questions, um, based on the information we've shared tonight, can guide our thought when we're planning a session. So right down to how we're, we're talking tonight is the design of the session. So does, as I'm getting my, my sheet out and I'm doing a planner or I'm doing it on the computer is I can start to actually um, critically think about what I'm putting down on. Does it actually look like the game? Mm. And then I can go through that list of questions. It's just prompting. So they're not, they don't have to be hard and fast. They're just prompting me as, as I'm designing the activity to the people in front of me. And then I can actually take that list to the, the session as well. And because sometimes the map isn't the same as the territory, so what I actually plan doesn't show up the same as in, in reality as well. So I can take my checklist with me and my design with me and go, okay, now I'm watching this in front of me. Is there a consequence? Am I seeing that? You know, okay, I see there's an opposition. Is it a realistic opponent? Mm. You know, is it an appropriate, is it an appropriate opponent in terms of that challenge level we talked about earlier? How could I tweak that? So this can guide us within the session. And then afterwards, when we're doing mm. our reflection process is I can stick with the design checklist and go, okay, after that, 
did the practice allow for transition? Okay, how might I make that better next time? What went well? Yeah. And this, so I can use this design checklist all the way through. So from my planning process to guide me as I'm designing the session, I can then actually check it live while I'm in the session. And then afterwards, when I'm doing my reflection as a coach, is I can use the, 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 the questions here to, to prompt me on that as well. And these aren't an exhaustive list as they no. just guide us. They just guide us in terms of some of the topics we've, we've touched on tonight. Yeah. Yeah. The, the big couple for me are incentive, right? Like if I'm a player and it's the middle of winter and I'm standing around while the coach talks or we work through unopposed work and I'm thinking I'd probably rather be at home, um, then the incentive is key. So if we've got goals, if we've got direction, if we've got consequence, the session's going to motivate the players. Um, as I said earlier, very, very rarely have I met a player that doesn't love playing the game. That's why we all started, as you alluded to. The other one, which I think is a real-world challenge to address here, is the shape and size of the pitch. We know that in most grassroots coaching environments, facilities are a challenge. Um, area size, you're often sharing a pitch with two or three other teams on the night. Um, and uh, obviously, whichever level you're operating at, you can be more fortunate or less fortunate around that um, area. So if you don't have access to realistic pitch geography, as we talked about with a full half pitch or a full court in your sport, um, then consider how you can modify that. And for me, small sided games are a great way to go um, around at least creating um, realism and decision making within the practice. So hopefully that checklist adds a bit of value. We're heading towards the end of the webinar Dan, let's sort of work through these key takeaways. We've tried to shine a light on three key points here that we've tried to present uh, in this discussion. And for you, the first one, why is that so important? So, yeah, if, if we've never seen it before, then it brings it into existence for us. And then we can put it in our coaching toolbox, um, which will help us to better meet the needs of the people in front of us. Like we didn't just pull that out of the hat and go, yeah, let's show this to people. As we shared it with a reason is we believe it can be useful for people across sport and context to best meet the needs of the people that they're coaching. Um, so I feel that then the, the magic of the coaching is, is understanding your scenario and selecting where you tune in or plug in on that spectrum at, at mm. different moments within within the week or within the within the coaching um, plan that you're working through. So yeah, I think that would be the the big one for me on the first point. Anything you'd add to that? No, look, I, th I think you've got it covered. I think as long as we know it's there and we understand how we can use it relative to our context, that's key. The second point for me. Having worked alongside you on the grass, Dan, this is something I know you're massive on and being intentional by including joy. Now, whether that's mm -hmm. just through the game or allowing for some space within the practice for players to um, go and practice what they want and design their own sessions or ensure that there's real joy there, I think is key. We often think about um, planning our practices and the X's and O's. We often think about even sometimes at a more advanced level about planning our interventions and how are we going to step in and affect the players tonight um, but do we always consciously plan to include joy or that motivation engagement in our sessions? I think that's really valuable. Um, the last point here around the three hours, we've certainly um, reiterated the importance of this. I think the fact that there are trade-offs as we dial up and down um, the different parts of the spectrum and we will have different consequences is key. Any sort of additional thoughts around that last point for you, Dan? Um, not on the last part. I'm going to touch on the second one again is when we're saying intentional and in including joy, I think intentional is the key word there is it's not like, oh, yeah, it'll be fun because we're playing games mm. is actually be thoughtful around, OK, I've heard this feedback from the people I'm working with or I've, I've heard it from the children or I'm asking them at the end of the session, what did they enjoy? Because that will mm. guide me in future session design to to get joy in there. And actually, like you said, is. With that, it came from um, uh, a coach that's fortunate to spend some time with um, Mick Beal, who's now now with Rangers, and he talked about, with me about his experience in Brazil and around mm. how joy was massive for them. And then from that, it was actually a component of all my training sessions. And I'm talking from young ones, so we're talking about foundation age, 5 to 11, in the youth phase, 12, 12 to 18, and then also working with, with senior players over, over in New Zealand as well is actually blocking out a period of training at the end for 15 minutes that will be based purely on joy. What do I think the players will enjoy? How do I mm. know what they'll enjoy? It's through conversation that's come over the weeks prior to that. Yeah, so I think intentional is, is the key piece for that. It's, it's Absolutely. important.
Absolutely. It's, it's crucial. So look, the big question to finish things up, ask yourself when you're designing your sessions, does it look like the game? Um, consider those three R's around realism, relevance, and repetition and how you move across the spectrum. If you're more interested in this concept of does it look like the game, uh, the academic terminology is around representative learning design. Um, we recommend you refer to the work of Brunswick, Bernstein, and Renshaw there, um, uh, some of which have been some of the great writers, at least on the academic and research side of this. So that's probably uh, it from us. I think at this point um, we can bring Hamish back in and uh, he can wrap things up. So thank you so much to everybody who's joined us. Uh, apologies if we didn't get to all of your questions. There were some great ones in the room, and thanks so much for having us. Dave, Dan, um, thank you so much. I really enjoyed that. Um, I just probably want to recap the point that Dan made at the end there about just being intentional about joy within training design. That was probably the big takeaway mm. for me. Is is And I, I like to think about it, as you talked about earlier tonight, in terms of, how do you stack the incentives? How do you structure or create the incentives within your training uh, to bring about moments of joy? Um, that's it for us tonight. Um, everyone who's joined us, thank you very much. As Dave said, we've got another webinar coming up in a fortnight. So if you haven't registered um, and you're interested, uh, please do. That one, I believe, was around the athlete, parent and coach relationship. So be sure to check that out. We'll just close off our uh, kaupapa tonight with the Sport New Zealand karakia. Tutua mai i ranga, tutua mai i raru, tutua mai i roto, tutua mai i wahu, kia tu ai te Māori tu, kia tu ai te Māori ora, tu tu whakamoa, kia tina, tina. Home e ei, hui e ei, tai ki ei. All right, everyone. Thank you very much again for joining us tonight. We hope you enjoyed yourselves. We look forward to catching you next time.